the clinical research concept conduct and significance in this basically this is going to be a very introductory very superficial kind of a lecture not very deep not going to talk uh, of very big things uh, going to talk very superficially and going to introduce uh, basically we'll be introducing the terms that uh, you may encounter uh, during the research and the talk is divided into three part the first is the concept as it says where we'll be talking about what are the various designs and how they are classified conduct that how a clinical trial or clinical research is conducted what are the regulations governing the clinical trial and conduct and lastly we'll be talking about significance where i'll talk about uh, other things which are related with uh, the conduct of clinical trials the slide is discovery by forethought and serendipity uh, i don't know how many of you have uh, read the amir khusro's uh, hasti shit uh, which was written in 1302 and later on uh, translated where uh, he this is basically later on in english translation is known as the three princes of serendip this is a story of three people who have uh, power of deduction and uh, by looking at uh, things that are happening they are able to uh, they are able to uh, decide what it has so basically their father wants to choose the best among the three he sends the three princes to a far east land they are walking in the desert and then they see uh, a camel footprint in the desert the one says it's a camel the second says the camel has one eye the uh, then the first again says the camel is carrying honey and uh, oil and then uh, like this so it's about deduction and uh, discovery by forethought and serendipity basically is uh, the uh, faculty of making discovery by accident or uh, unexpected observations which you encounter during ongoing investigation leads to another discovery so basically it deals with the power of deduction we talk a lot about luck and uh, scientifically the luck is classified into four uh, different type of luck the most common or most rare is the blind luck blind luck is uh, something which provide opportunity to anyone who is motivated to research and uh, just like that a rare disease rare clinical presentation or rare phenomena occurs in front of your eyes and you are there to witness it things that happen by chance uh, are type 1 type 2 is motion Uh, motion happens motion is a type of luck which happens when uh, you are looking for something else and you stumble on to something new the example which is given here is of the epstein barr virus burkitt was uh, working with malaria and he encountered uh, what is today known as burkitt's disease so uh, what he did was uh, he thought that it is also a vector borne disease just like a malaria and uh, when he came to england he met epstein and who did the that was the time when scanning microscopes has just come and he uh, found out that it is a virus particle which is causing it so uh, because he was working on malaria he observed a disease and a chance meeting with epstein led to discovery of epstein barr virus this type of uh, deductions are called or chance are called motion he was not looking for epstein barr virus he was not looking for the uh, burkitt's disease also but he was working on malaria so this is this disease was detected while he was working on malaria so it's called motion the third is called recognizing good fortune the example here uh, is of alexander fleming and florian chain fleming discovered the penicillin but it was florian chain who found out that uh, what importance what was the importance of uh, penicillin that it kills bacteria so uh, opportunity which is looked by all but one so it is something which florian chain found and it was a class 3 chance that what even alexander fleming could not discover florian chain did 
and the fourth which most of us do is persistent and lateral thinking we keep uh, doing and doing more and more research and we keep thinking every time we read a paper every time we go through something we uh, keep persisting and go for a lateral thinking thinking out of the box what is called is the directed motion so what is research research is it's a very simple definition of research that research is an organized and systematic way of finding answers to question so basically there are three things that it is systematic that is it define it uses a definite set of procedure and steps that are to be followed it is organized that uh, the planned procedures that there is a structured methods in going about the things and the questions which are essential to central of the research i am not going to talk about how to frame questions how to convert your questions to hypothesis how to convert your hypothesis to null hypothesis in this particular lectures but if later if somebody thinks that uh, they should learn that probably another lecture on that uh, we can organize uh, clinical research is uh, a branch of healthcare which determines the safety and effectiveness of medication devices diagnostic products and treatment regime which are intended for human use so when the research is applied to the clinical science it becomes a clinical research this can be for prevention of a disease can be treatment of a disease or diagnosis of a disease or relieve symptoms of a disease whatever it is when it is has a clinical application it becomes a clinical research there are different classifications given for uh, research i am going to use only two and uh, the simplest classification is observational and interventional observational clinical trials are where you simply observe the cohort or the people group of people with a similar characteristics and do nothing just keep recording your observations those studies are called observational studies and where you intervene intervene by meaning of doing a test in one and not doing a test in the other group or giving a drug to one group not giving a drug to other group or giving a different drug to other group it becomes an interventional trial and the interventional trials can be randomized and can be blinded so simple classification observational and interventional if we look at uh, the kind of studies that we do uh, most of the descriptive studies that we come across are observational studies uh, there are some which are called cross sectional studies and uh, the case studies and the case reports that we publish are all type of descriptive studies there is no intervention being done in most of them but case reports or case studies can be interventional also and uh, interventional studies can be randomized blinded double blinded there can be single group studies where you use only one group of patients and single drug or different doses of drug in a single group you can have placebo controls or you can have crossover trials crossovers when uh, there are two treatment arms and patients are allowed to cross over from one treatment arm to another treatment arm is called crossover studies and in the bottom there is something called as a social science research which i will not be talking about in this particular presentation because it's an entirely different form of research uses different designs different tools for measurements and uh, this is uh, basically used for something like quality of life studies like if you want to measure cost masses you want to measure burnouts then uh, you what the research you do is a social science research even the cost based research if you want to see cost effectiveness those are also comes under social science research this is another classification which is given by brahman and bell brahman and as bell has divided it into exploratory research what we also called as pilot studies this is a research which is done before uh, there is enough evidence available so we uh, we we have a question but we don't have enough material to go about we don't know how to uh, carry out a sample size or how to calculate a sample size uh, you can take example of say corona spread there is no background information on uh, how infective the virus is what percentage of people has to be infected before a herd immunity develops 
so uh, what you do is you do a exploratory research first do a pilot study see uh, what is happening and based on the results of the pilot you design your final studies the advantage of doing exploratory research is it helps you determine the best research design data collection and method and uh, use of subjects if you don't do a pilot and straight away launch a, launch a study you uh, may be successful or you may not be successful depending upon whether the design you took was the right design or the wrong design then it has descriptive studies descriptive is basically which describe the characteristic of a population so uh, basically you know there are five questions how when why what and who these are the five questions that a research has to answer so descriptive uh, addresses what and who that means it will tell you that what kind of subjects will benefit or what kind of subjects will not benefit and who will benefit who will not benefit but other questions it's not going to answer so this is a descriptive study it describes the characteristic of a population or a phenomena being being studied as you are reading every day about covid so let's take an example from covid so uh, when we say that the covid uh, what are the group uh, where the mortality rate is high so you take all the people who have died from covid look at uh, look at the age groups in which the deaths have occurred and most of the time you are going to find that it is the elderly people who are dying so this is nothing but a descriptive uh, study where you looked at all the deaths that has happened in the world because of covid and you simply stratified those death by age and at the end of the day you find that that which po which population is or who is dying from covid so it does not establish a casual relationship between variables because you cannot study any more variables you can simply say that what is happening and to whom it is happening on the other hand if you have why and how questions then you have to look at the uh, do the analytical studies in an analytical study you basically look at the cause effect relationship among variables you can have a single variable you can have multiple variables you can use analytical methods like a like a statistical methods and you can model uh, your data based on uh, these uh, procedures these tools so this is called the second tool is called analytical tool which is going to uh, tell you that why and how the things are happening another research strategy which has come uh, into force and i'll talk about it later it's called critical the critical basically we has come from karl marx critique it basically is a research which challenges the uh, norms or the evidence which is already established and this kind of research is sometimes called as transformative research because it is going to transform the already established theories i'll talk about it that why it is done and how it is done basically it focuses on uh, analysis of bias inconsistency gaps in knowledge contradiction in account theories studies or model so if you have established theory it basically challenges tries to find out that why this theory is wrong or could be wrong and then challenges and designs a new study which challenges the established studies then most commonly that we do is predictive and confirmatory studies this is the most commonly done studies which are quantitative studies which identify measurable variables and uh, we can manipulate the variables to produce measurable effects here we use a null hypothesis which is proven or uh, disproven and uh, it is dependent on accurate sampling and uses the established uh, uses statistical tests to establish the casual relationship variance between sample and the predictive trends so this confirmatory and predictive uh, research is something which is commonly done then there was a question last week on number needed to treat so this is for tarun especially number needed to treat is the number of patients you require to treat or prevent one additional bad outcome the flow chart is given here suppose we have uh, the example i'll read the example rather than the uh, what should be done the example used here is a clinical trial of cholesterol lowering agent over 5 years and has found that 8% of the patient uh, died in the treatment group and 12% died in the control group 
so the difference between the control and the treatment group is 4% so number needed to treat it is 100 by 4 that is 25 so to prevent one death you have to treat 25 patients minimum so this is the number needed to treat the uh, mathematical expression of number needed to treat is given here Basically, we are looking at two things. One is the outcome, which could be the death, which could be the disease-free survival. And on the other hand, we have uh, treatment. So we are looking at the treatment and the outcomes. And uh, if uh, the treatment is given and the outcome is present, then it is the box is called A. If the treatment is given, outcome is absent, it's called B. Treatment is given and uh, outcome is treatment is not given but yet outcome is present is c and d and based on that we find out the experimental event ratio control event ratio then absolute risk reduction which is nothing but the control ratio minus the uh, experimental event ratio and uh, one upon absolute risk reduction is the number of needed to treat so in most of the clinical trials you are going to come across the absolute risk reduction and you are also going to come across the number needed to treat. Then there is an intention to treat. Most of you know that it basically means that all patients who are enrolled in uh, enrolled in this study and randomized are included in the analysis. And uh, the dictum here is once randomized, always analyzed. Opposite is as treatment as treated analysis. As treated analysis, those who have completed the treatment are only analyzed. Protocol analysis can be intention to treat or as treated. It has to protocol analysis is when the type of analysis is specified in the protocol. It could be as treated or intention to treat. Now, uh, what happens in uh, intention to treat? It takes all patients into account. Any deviation that may happen after randomization, if there is a protocol violation or uh, uh, patients who has not completed uh, allocated treatment because of any reason like he's lost to follow up or he withdraws from the study he is non-compliant to the treatment given to him or he refuses to get treated <coughs> all the conditions uh, he will be still be included this is this time this type of uh, analysis is very important when we are talking about talking about minimal invasive surgery because uh, most of the studies that you are going to read on uh, minimum invasive uh, do not include the cases which are converted into analysis. It has to be remembered that those who are converted are also part of the initial sample and they should also be included in the analysis because conversion rate is one of the uh, parameters that tells you that how successful the laparoscopic treatment had been. Then there is something called as an interim analysis. This interim analysis is again something which you have to plan when you are doing a, planning a clinical research. And uh, this interim analysis is an analysis of data that is conducted before the data completion has con completed. So that means somewhere half, somewhere half the mark, you may say that the moment I have 30 mortalities in my group, I am going to do an interim analysis. Or 24 months after recruitment, I'm going to do an interim analysis. The advantage of uh, interim analysis is that if you are going to do an interim analysis, you're going to find out whether the study results are beneficial or harmful. If they are harmful, you can stop your clinical trial in between rather than completing the clinical trial. So this is the advantage of interim analysis. This you are going to find in most of the uh, new clinical trials which are being designed, a interim analysis is flat. Suppose I plan a final analysis, say, at 10 years of follow-up. But I can always do an interim analysis uh, when 50% of my recruitment is over. And then see that what is happening. Are there any side effects which are coming to the patients because of uh, uh, my treatment and then stop the treatment? Now, in a clinical trial, there are primarily six stakeholders. There are sponsors who are sponsoring this study, mostly uh, pharma companies who are putting up the money for your clinical trials, investigators, people like me and you who are conducting these studies. Then we have monitors. These monitors uh, are in between the sponsors and the investigators. They are independent. 
and their job is to do the data monitoring and see whether the data collection is proper or not then there are regulators which are drug authorities in india drug controller journal of india is the regulator or government of india is the regulator then there are patients and then there are administrators like in banaras hindu university if i am conducting a clinical trial the administrators or the administration of banaras hindu university is one of the stakeholders so there are six uh, stakeholders mainly there could be more so the purpose of research is to find evidence and uh, all research is based on hypothesis now why do we want to collect this evidence See, we want to collect this evidence because this evidence is going to uh, change the healthcare practice uh, you will see the fourth line if there is already evidence and strong evidence no further research is required this was a dictum which was uh, being told till some times ago it has been stricken off because this is something uh, where the research is now taking place and uh, had the established uh, hypothesis or theories challenged we are not going to come across the new data and the new evidence it is quite possible that the evidence which has been gathered uh, may be a uh, not suitable as to present time because the science changes evidence changes the units of measurements changes everything changes so with time as the measurements changes the uh, way we collect the data the instruments that we use the technology that we use changes and these changes can probably change the hypothesis the best example that i use uh, for telling you that how how the concepts established concepts of their time change is gravity the first concept of gravity was given by aristotle who says that gravity is proportional to mass this was challenged by galileo in his leaning tower of pisa experiment where he threw two balls of similar size but different masses and uh, proved that the time of descent is independent of mass it is the size of the ball which uh, determined the descent newton gave universal law of gravity that you all know but it was cavendish who found the gravitational con constant and till uh, 1798 when the gravitational context of uh, the g was discovered the newton's th newton's theory was actually was hypothesis it became a universal law and mathematically proven only when cavendish gave the g in 1915 the einstein gave the theory of general relativity he uh, this is still a hypothesis because uh, what is proven by cavendish experiments in 1798 is true till now but there are two hypotheses which has been floated after that one is einstein theory of general relativity where he says it's not a ordinary force but it is a property of space time geometry and uh, einstein uh, basically talked about Uh, from the two dimensional gravity which was basically dependent upon the mass uh, and the distance changed it to uh, four dimension where he included the space and time now this has been changed by uh, friedman and ferrara who was now uh, floated a theory of uh, super gravity in super gravity what he says that gravity is just like uh, one of the fundamental forces like electromagnetic force weak uh, nuclear forces and strong nuclear forces and when uh, these three forces are included then it becomes a seven dimensional theory and today the current theory is a 11 dimension theory and then more and more dimension and more and more new uh, hypotheses are being uh, generated and added the last two theories the einstein's theory of relativity and the theory of super gravity uh, ha einstein's theory of gravity and super gravity has not been established but one day it's quite possible that these theories also these uh, hypotheses also may become so let's switch to clinical trials there are four phases of clinical trial you all know phase 1 is uh, what is known as first in man studies it is basically a pharmacological trial where you look at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic of a drug that how the drug behaves once it is given in sight it is usually done in a normal healthy individual but the drugs which are toxic or cytotoxic like anti cancers these are done in terminally ill patients who are going to die phase 2 are exploratory trials where you basically try to find out the toxicity 
So toxicity is to be looked first before you look at the efficacy of the drug, which is done in the phase three or confirmatory trials. Phase four are the post-marketing trials where you try to, uh, after it has been approved, you try to see that new uh, toxicity or new things are not coming up. A little bit about ethics. I'm not going to go in details of ethics because ethics itself require a full uh, lecture to be taken. So I'll just say that it is a universal principle. There are four principles uh, or four pillars of ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So basically, uh, it is talking about that you do no harm to your patients and always take consent from the patient. The consent should be an informed consent where patient is informed that what is uh, the side effects of the procedure or the effect of the procedures, what he gains, what he loses. And uh, the participation has to be voluntarily. So after the information is given to the patient, he decides whether he wants to participate or he doesn't want to participate. Uh, there are a number of uh, places where you are going to find and there are few guidelines uh, which are available. One is a good clinical practice guideline. This is uh, the Indian guideline is available at CDESCO website. Then there is International Conference of Harmonization ICH guidelines, which are specific to the pharmaceutical products and how they should be developed. Then there are ICMR guidelines on ethics, which are available on ICMR website and Declaration of Helsinki around which uh, all these ethical principle guidelines and good clinical practice guideline or ICH guidelines are built. The declaration of Helsinki has been modified a number of times and uh, uh, you can download all these. And uh, I'll suggest that if you are interested in clinical research, these are the four uh, frameworks which you should must read. Now I'm going to introduce three words, law, regulation, and guideline. These three you are going to come across when you are working. Law is a rule of conduct enforced by controlling authority. Like the law which is followed for clinical trial in India is Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1940 and rules of 1945. This is a law. Any violation of another law is a, is a penal offense and you can be prosecuted for violating the law. Regulation basically is a interpretation of how a law is implemented. So if I say the Drug and Cosmetic Act is the law, then the regulation that deals with the clinical trial is called Schedule Y. There are various schedules, Schedule H, Schedule M. Uh, so whenever you are going to pick up a tablet pack next time, uh, turn it around and see which schedule and under which schedule that particular medicine or a combination is governed. The clinical trials are governed under Schedule Y of the uh, Act. And guidelines are basically interpretation of regulations which has no legal binding. So if you do not follow the guideline, nobody can be nobody can prosecute you for not following the guideline. So guideline is something which tells you that if you are in a particular situation, this is how what you should do. Uh, like the ethical guidelines are basically tells you that this is, this is how you should go about uh, taking a consent. But then you have to actually follow what is given in Schedule Y. If Schedule Y says this is how you take the consent, that is what you have to follow. Guideline may say something which uh, usually says what is with the act but sometimes it may have something different also because the guideline can be older, the act can be newer. Like Schedule Y has a change in September 2019 and ethical guidelines have not changed accordingly. So there could be a discrepancy. Whatever is new, if the act is new, you follow the act. Now, uh, this act is available on uh, NACO as well as the CIDESCO uh, website and uh, if you have to do clinical trials please read the schedule Y and uh, especially the rule 122 which uh, governs that how uh, clinical trial should be conducted so I'm not going to go into the details but I'll just tell you uh, the amendments 
the uh, major amendment came in 2005 and uh, this amendment basically uh, included uh, permission for trial before this it was not a, it was not required to take dcgi permission for a trial 2005 they included that every trial has to be approved by dcgi it also fixed that what are the responsibility of sponsor responsibility of investigator and responsibility of the ethics committee it also introduced informed consent before prior to 2005 there was no concept of informed consent in schedule y this was uh, 2005 it has been brought in and uh, 2013 this has been converted to converted to video of the informed consent that the whole process of informed consent has to be videographed then uh, studies in special population like ch children pregnant women and nursing mothers are also included in 2005 amendment this is a very busy slide uh, and uh, i don't want you to remember everything but uh, what are the clinical trials what are the permissions to uh, conduct to the clinical trials what are the compensations uh, in cases of uh, trial related injury or death uh, who has the right to inspect who gives the permission uh, the how the ethical committees are registered these are some of the things which are uh, incorporated into schedule y now this one is a very important slide uh, for everyone who is doing a clinical trial or who is thinking of doing a clinical trial that what is considered as injury or death due to clinical trial related injury if there is adverse effect of a investigational product and patient dies or develops an injury it is considered as clinical trial related injury or death and patient has to be compensated suppose you have a drug and patient drug develops a drug sensitivity reaction drug sensitivity reaction leads to uh, or extravasation of drug leads to necrosis or uh, cellulitis which produces an injury and uh, disables the person for a certain period of time then the sedesco is going to compensate that patient financially and you will you are liable to pay that money to the patient if there is a violation of the approved protocol scientific misconduct negligence by either the sponsor or the investigator patient has to be compensated failure of investigational product to provide intended therapeutic relief so if you are claiming that drug a cures uh, disease b and if it does not cure it and patient dies then you have to compensate the patient use of placebo in placebo control trial if you are using a placebo in a placebo control trial in certain situations it might be all right like suppose you are working on mild pain and you have a mild pain killer comparing a drug a with placebo you may be all right because uh, if the pain doesn't get control you can always cross over the patient or give him another drug but if you are doing a placebo control trial say for example in cancer you are primarily de denying him the treatment of cancer so in such a situation uh, the if person dies because patient doesn't get treatment of cancer or treatment of hypertension or treatment of diabetes you are liable to pay uh, the loss and damages to the patient if there are adverse effect due to contamination con concomitant medication excluding standard care necessitated as a part of approved protocol so if you give a drug and the drug uh, additional drug has a reaction you are liable to pay. if uh, you didn't do a pregnancy test included a woman in the trial she becomes pregnant and the uh, child in utero dies you have to pay compensation so there are number of ways uh, this compensation is given and uh, the schedule by the new guidelines uh, which are to come in uh, 2019 also uh, defines that how this compensation is calculated i have not included it here so probably when we are talking of schedule y and clinical trial regulations i'll probably talk about how the compensations are calculated another important thing for all of us uh, to remember that the ethics committee which is reviewing the protocol and providing approval for the clinical work 
clinical trials should be registered with DCGI. So if there are centers, because now there are more centers working and uh, all thesis work is going on, all thesis work is considered as clinical work, especially in the clinical sites, like surgery, medicine, clinical branches. So if any work is being done and uh, you get an ethical committee approval, you have to ensure that the ethical committee is of your institution is registered with DCGI. If it does not, you cannot, they cannot accord approval to the study or it will not be valid. Uh, These new guidelines have come into effect from 19 September 29. And I'm not going to detail these. These are available on Cedesco website. So it's my request uh, to all of you to download these and read that how they are regulating the uh, clinical trial. New drug CTR rules 2019 dot pdf is the pdf available it's a gadget notification and uh, you will get it from the cdesco website so what are the prerequisites for running a clinical trial you have to have a permission from drug controller journal of india you have to have approval from your ethics committee where the study is planned then the clinical trial has to be registered on icmr mandated uh, maintained website this is ctri.in and you should have insurance. Now the insurance has become very important uh, component because uh, uh, the compensation part has been added. So you may be required to pay compensation and hence the uh, insurance part has become very important. Monitoring. Uh, In 2013, there is a very famous case uh, which is going on, which was filed in Supreme Court by Swastha Dikar Manch. And uh, this case made a lot of uproar. Uh, if you go back to 2013 newspapers, you'll find a lot of uh, unethical clinical trials and deaths from the clinical trials being discussed. And uh, after that, uh, the Supreme Court has directed that there should be a monitoring panel. The There are two monitoring panels. Uh, so. Uh, the first monitoring is actually done in your own institute by your own ethical committee, which I'll come to later. But there are two uh, committees which are monitoring every clinical trial that is conducted in this country. One is the technical committee, which is under the chairmanship of the uh, DGHS, that is Director General of Health Services. And then Apex committee, which is chaired by the Secretary Health and Family Welfare. So these committees meet regularly and they uh, evaluate and monitor the progress of every clinical trial. To the ethical committee, one has to submit a report every six months of the progress of the work which has been done. Then apart from that, there could be a local monitoring committee which can monitor uh, the, which can go to the site, go to the place and monitor. And then there could be a monitoring by the trial sponsors, which I already talked about in stakeholders. So there are three local monitorings, monitoring uh, by the local monitoring committee, monitoring by the ethical committee, monitoring by the trial sponsors. Then there are two monitoring bodies, one under chairmanship of DGHS and one under chairmanship of uh, Secretary uh, Health. So all these reports, or when the report is submitted, suppose there is a severe adverse event or an adverse event. Every time an adverse event happens, a report is given to the ethical committee who deliberates it in their meeting, files a report on it, and then the ethical committee sends it to the DCGI uh, for placing before the uh, DGHS committee. And from there, it goes to the health, minister, the health secretary committee. And if they decide that the CAB adverse event or adverse event or a death has occurred because of this, the compensation will be awarded. So what are the problems in conducting clinical trials? One is complexities. There are a lot of regulations and every year it is becoming more and more complex. The cost required to conduct clinical trials is huge because the insurance component has now come in and the compensation uh, component has to be taken into account. The cost of clinical trials have increased. 
then patient access uh, is another one the moment you tell somebody that it's a new drug uh, may benefit may not benefit the chances are that patient may or may not agree to participate in clinical trials in united states uh, it is permissible to adver ad advertise uh, participation in for participation in clinical trials so you are going to find uh, advertisements asking people to uh, ask their doctor for eligibility into clinical trials but in india it is not uh, permitted so far then the staff role and responsibilities has been very well defined now and it creates a uh, lot of burden on people because it puts extra burden extra work uh, extra paperwork into everybody's basket governance and oversight and new drugs are other problems so a little bit uh, just introducing some other terms uh, which are associated with clinical trials and the publication of clinical trials one is misconduct now misconduct basically is uh, intentional wrong doing Uh, people will always ask what is the difference between a mistake and a misconduct so the difference between mistake and misconduct is intention anything which is done intentionally is misconduct and if it is done unintentionally it is a mistake in research misconduct the definition says fabrication falsification plagiarism in proposing performing or reviewing research or in reporting research result is all called research misconduct penalty for research misconduct uh, in banaras hindu university if you are a student you are terminated immediately and if you are a faculty member then also now there are various ways that why data may be incorrect if you have a wrong design or a inappropriate essay your data could be wrong if your hypothesis is wrong which is often based on the other people's work and if their work was wrong then your work is also liable to be wrong bad instruments is one of the commonest things it is just like your bathroom weighing scale if your weighing scale is plus 5 then everything measured on that will be plus 5 so if your instrument is not accurate if it is not measuring accurately all measurements made by that instrument will be wrong inappropriate analysis of data this is something which we have been discussing that how data should be analyzed what test should be used interpretation of data is wrong then also research is wrong and then bad ethics and scientific misconducts uh, is also participating to in uh, incorrect scientific data a new thing that has come up for quite some time is now conflict of interest conflict of interest is a set of condition in which professional judgment concerning a primary interest which is the patient's welfare tend to be unduly influenced by secondary interest which is a financial gain uh, this is more commonly seen in the west where uh, a person who develops a new drugs also get uh, kind of uh, shape by shares in the company or a shareholder in the company so if a drug is approved he also benefits from the rise in the cost of the share and his participation in the company so financial gains second thing is that uh, some of the investigators are funded by the company so they may be doing a clinical trial which is funded by the same company who is manufacturing that clinical trial so this conflict of interest has to be declared that the principal investigator was funded by the pharmaceutical company new thing that has come in science is whistle blowing whistle blowing is that uh, another member of the organization comes out and tells people of the illegal doing or immoral practices which are happening in the institution or by their colleagues so it is called whistle blowing it is same as whistle blowing in uh, politics some of the last slides that why do people cheat one of the important thing is that there is a intense competition either you publish or you perish so if you are not able to do uh, the research if you are not able to generate the fundings if you are not able to generate enough amount of fundings you may uh, lose your job so publish or perish is more pertinent to india where uh, for promotions you are required to publish two original articles so if you are not going to do research you will not be able to come out with two original articles so you have to do some kind of research and produce some kind of two papers loss of funding is more appropriate for western world where the especially us where the salaries are linked uh, to the r0 or r1 grants that a person receives or his laboratory funding and his supportive fundings everything is dependent on 
the amount of funding that he receives from the funding agencies it's not very uh, pertinent to india where you get your salary irrespective of the research that you do then there could be greed people may do it for money people may do it for fame people may do it for awards uh, some people are so sure they are so arrogant that no they say that if i do this research this is the only outcome that can come so arrogance can be there and most important is the cultural differences where the values and definition in the society makes uh, a huge impact so we know there are certain societies uh, now if you look at the publication ethics or uh, i also edit a journal so if i look at the journal submissions and uh, the review reports the most scientific misconducts are being conducted in china which is at number 1 at present followed by iran at number 2 india is not far behind the impact of this uh, scientific misconducts what happens who who are the people at risk most importantly me and you because we get cheated somebody has falsified the trial records and a drug which was not working has been proven as working it is taken by me you our family members and we all end up suffering there are number of drugs which has come to the market and has been withdrawn the cox2 inhibitors uh, is the recent story which increased the incidence of uh, stroke in patients who were using uh, cox2 inhibitors then the honest scientists who are actually doing the work their reputation is also uh, tarnished when i said that two countries from where the maximum scientific misconducts are being reported are china and iran now everybody in china is not dishonest everybody in iran is not dishonest but what happens is that even when there is a honest research coming from those countries that also goes through a microscope to see whether uh, this is properly conducted or not conducted ethics approvals have taken or not taken consents are there or not there so even the honest scientists who are working on those countries are also sufferers third the where does the money comes from for this research it is the taxpayers money it is out of the money which is allocated on the, allocated from the gdp on the healthcare so it is our money or the public money which is wasted so these are the three people who are basically sufferers now uh, the best way of avoiding all these trouble and streamlining thing is education but unfortunately clinical trials and clinical research is not in the curriculum and uh, nobody teaches uh, to conduct a clinical trials or how to do a research so in absence of a def defined curriculum the bhu has introduced uh, research design ethics and clinical trials in phd curriculum but it has not yet included it in the ms md and mchdm curriculum basically the people who are doing research the students learn how to do a research if a person is doing a honest research his students learn to do honest research if a person is doing a dishonest research his student learns to do dishonest research and uh, now there are some web based classes and courses have started and uh, these are also available so everybody does it that way is not an excuse so you have to be different from what other people says so i'll end the talk with conclusion that clinical research should be conducted strictly as per the guideline rules acts and regulations that everyone has to uh, read and uh, know violation is punishable offense and one can have even a jail sentence for violating the clinical trial rules laws and schedule y application of proper research design analysis and interpretation is essential because if any of the three things is wrong the uh, research outcome will be wrong always keep your local ethics committee in the loop if there is any adverse event or uh, sae inform your ethics committee within 24 hours that this has happened and keep informing them updating him till the patient dies or goes discharges or when goes home this is very common in uh, oncology clinical trials because most of the people who are given the 
anti cancer drugs develop neutropenia so the moment there is a neutropenia in a clinical trial patient within 24 hours inform your uh, ethics committee that there is a neutropenia and uh, start taking action uh, to correct that neutropenia the patient the moment the neutropenia is corrected patient is fine again inform your ethics committee that this was there this has been done and now the patient is discharged and gone home take consent keep patient informed be ethical and avoid trouble thank you